What's the What's the Church of Scientology so afraid of? This, this is, is SPTV. SPTV. Welcome back to SPTV, everyone. Where, as we always say, every day is a good day not to be in a cult. Um, I have a very special guest today. Um, former Scientologist, former Sea Org member, and um, stepfather, former stepfather of Danny Masterson. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm talking today with Joe Reich. Uh, was a professional rugby player out of New Zealand. Uh, he's from New Zealand. When I bring him on, he'll explain uh, if he really played fo uh, footy for New Zealand. I might have that wrong. Um, he is Joe is the biological father of Danny Masterson's two siblings, Alana Masterson and Jordan Masterson. They used to be known as Alana Reich and Jordan Reich. And once Scientology destroyed their family and estranged them from their father, they changed their name, took the Masterson name a move they might uh, might be regretting at the moment. So anyhow, without any further ado, let me bring on my guest, Joe Reich. How are you doing, sir? Good afternoon, Aaron. Nice to talk to you. Nice to see you. How are you, sir? Doing great. Um, hey, let's tell everybody about your professional rugby career real quick. What, are you from New Zealand? Did you play no, for New from Zealand? from Australia originally, born in oh. Sydney. Shit, sorry. Okay, um, just a little bit of information for you, but that was fine. But uh, I played rugby league with the, with a team called the Sydney Roosters. The Sydney Roosters are equivalent to, let's say, the San Francisco 49ers, that kind of team. Been around for 100 plus years, very famous club. It was a lifetime dream of mine to play for that club as a kid. And, uh, you know, after a, a harrowing experience during the uh, Civil War in Beirut for about four or five years, I got caught up in that, unfortunately. We can talk about that briefly, but I ended up playing professional football for them at the age of 19, which was quite miraculous because uh, four years before that I was dodging bullets. So it was quite a uh, dream come true for me as a kid. Wow. So how does a professional athlete in Australia get into Scientology? Well, uh, my case was very simple. I was walking down the street. It's going to be what you call your typical body routing type of approach where, you know, I was sitting there uh, waiting for the bus to, to go home. And then a lady approached me and said, uh, would you like to answer a few questions? I said, well, oh, that was pretty strange. No one really does that normally. And um, so I answered these three questions. She was very, you know, nice, you know, respectful. And she said, would you like to know further uh, more about, you know, how to learn, to learn more about it? And I said, sure, why not? So we went around the corner. It was in what they call Central Railway in Sydney. And there I walked into this building. The first thing I saw was a cross, and that was the Scientology cross up on the wall. Oh, that was really weird. And what is that all about? And then that was the time of selling me on uh, Dianetics, which was the study of the mind at the time. Remember, this was 1978. So um, it was quite new in Scientology at the time. And uh, I, I didn't even know what was it about. So that's how it started, Aaron. Wow. Okay, so you said you started playing pro footy at 19. When was this that you got body routed into Scientology? 79. What so happened you're was I around 20? Like uh, Yeah, just, just before 20. I tore a groin muscle. In my first year, and I was out for most of the season, and I'd gone to see doctors, orthopedists, acupuncturists, you name it, to, to treat it. And there was no real cure or addressed, you know, physiotherapy for torn groin muscles at that time. No different than knee surgeries. Because if you, if you tore a knee or did your ACL back in the 70s, it was over. Career was done. Now guys come back fitter, stronger, and better because the technology for healing and repair is much more advanced. So I wasn't getting nowhere with it. And so uh, when I was walked into the Dianetics organization, they said, well, it's all in the mind. I said, well, really? You know, and it's the first time I've ever heard that was all in the mind concept. Okay. And so uh, they tried to sell me on the Dianetics book. And I said, look, I'm not going to read the book. It was too thick, 300 pages, whatever it was. I said, look, I'll buy the book, but I'm not going to read it. Okay? <laughs> because I just, I saw the small print. I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give this a miss. And then she said, would you like to do an OCA, an Oxford Capacity Analysis? I said, well, what's that? You know, so I said, fine, I'll do that. So we did that test and it came back and it was in an indirect way. She said, there's something bothering you. I said, yeah, I said, there's only it's bothering me. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, my groin muscle playing football. She said, well, who do you play for? And I told him and she almost had a heart attack. And she just stopped whatever she did and said, could you just wait right here? I said, sure. Didn't think too much of it. And all of a sudden, within about five minutes, there were like seven Sea Org members in the office. And they were all crazy supporters of the team that I used to I play for. So they were going nuts. 
because now all of a sudden this, what do you want to call it, celebrity, if you want to use that word, is now in New York. And now he wants to, you know, and that's how it started, to be honest. Amazing. And, you know, and I, just, uh, I went on uh, you know, that path. So you went on later, um, which I'm going to ask you more about later in this interview. You went on yeah. later to join the C organization. Yep. Uh, you worked at Flag. You had a very important role of helping um, fix refund requests when people were asking for their money back. You were sort and, of and general upset people and pissed off people. You name it. I had the gamut of that. Yeah. Anyway. And so, how did um, how did you come to meet the Masterson clan? As I, I mean, I don't, I don't say that derogatorily. There's a no, lot of no, masters. It's, no, it's, it's a clan. It's definitely a clan. There's no question about that, Aaron. Um, so when, met, when did you uh, first meet them, and how did that happen? I met Carol and uh, Peter, in actually in Los Angeles in '82. I was doing my OT levels up to OT five, because back then there was no advanced organization in Australia, so you had to leave Australia to come to LA. So I came to LA in 1980 to do up to OT3 for those people that understand where that level is. And then I went back in late 82 to do OT5, 6, and 7, wherever that took me. And I met them in Los Angeles. Great people, married couple. Pete's a good guy, athlete. And I met Danny and Chris at the same time, youngsters. Beautiful family. Very, very, very nice family. So when and you they first were doing met them courses at that time, in AOLA, in the in the blue building, as you would call it, was there already a celebrity center back then? In um, in uh, in LA, y yeah, did that already exist? Sort of, it was sort of official, not official. Do you know what I mean? They didn't really nail it down because it was used to be called the the Fort, uh, the, the Manor Hotel. That's what it was originally called, and a very famous hotel from the twenties and thirties with actors and actresses. They shot 48 hours, the movie with uh, Eddie Murphy in that scene in the manor. So it had a, had a reputation and uh, it was run down. But at the time, and I was there in the, in the 80s, very run down. OK, so that was about 82. Correct. OK, so when you first met the Mastersons, Carol was still married to uh, Danny's Peter. father, Pete. Yes. And so then what happened from there? How did you and Carol end up getting married and having kids? Well, two or three years passed and uh, she'd gotten divorced. And I was in uh, I was in the United States, and we we got back together again. We started dating, and uh, you know I was to give you some lead up to why I was in the States. I'd played football up until about 1983, and this ties into this whole why that I joined the Sea Org and why that I finished my football career because that's pretty important. And what the, what the viewers should understand is uh, the general athlete in Scientology. We don't have too many of them, Aaron. And, and the reason we're there is for performance, not for spiritual gain. No, athletes don't look at spiritual gain. They just look at performance. And if you're performing, obviously you're successful. And if you're successful, then the rest is history. But in Scientology at the time, the problem was I'd gone up the whole bridge up until 1983. I was OT7 class 5. And the idea that if you went all the way up the bridge, you could be, as you're familiar with that term, be cause over matter, energy, space, and time. Well, from the layman's term, that pretty much means control over thought, materialistically or not. You know, if you want to use I dream of genie with the winking of the nose, fair enough. But that's what you thought it was because no one would have designed that bridge to awareness if it was bullshit. You couldn't be that, you couldn't be that screwed up in the head to, to lay that whole level out and it was fraud at the end of the day. Too good to be true. I guess at the end of the day, you find that out. But for an athlete, this is what's important. We were there to do whatever it took to become better. And I was a gung-ho student. I was an A student at school, I was an ace athlete. Fine, study 40, 50 hours a week, no problem. Why? Because we were driven by passion to be better and to win. And that drives you to do whatever it has to be done. Now, when that didn't happen, and there was no there was no justification why it was just <clears throat> excuse me it was just that it didn't deliver i was a willing student or i was a willing participant but the technology could not deliver that particular product and i said on uh, with tony ortega and, and all my other guys i said look you could feel good in scientology there's some good stuff into it but you absorb what's useful and then you disregard what's useless and then you add what's specifically your own that's a bruce lee quote and it's really true. 
but you couldn't do that in Scientology. It had to be them or, or that was it. Right. So I then so, said, well, all right, it wasn't working. I couldn't make it to the career. I was playing great football, but I never accomplished those particular goals. Well, I ran into suppression. I ran into, you know, the politics of football, favoritism. And it was just like, I didn't want to do that anymore. So then I decided, well, I might as well just join the SEAL, okay, and go spiritually free, class 12, because there is a class 5 auditor. So go all the way up the bridge, class 9, class 12, fine. That'll be another game. I could do that. And that was the reason why I joined. And Carol mm -hmm. wanted to join. So I was in my, almost uh, simultaneously, we felt, well, this was, a, you know, the right action to do. And that's what we did. And that's why so we joined the SEAL. So let me ask you this. So you joined, you got into Scientology in 79 by 83, 78, 78, yeah. se yeah. 78, 78. Yeah. by, by 83, you were already class five OT seven. Yeah. I was the highest trained HRD auditor, way to happiness auditor, class auditor, period. I did everything. Hmm. That's and, incredible. And, and it was like, it was easy for me because I said academics was easy for me. It turned out to be my benefit because I had to know this technology. And you've got to be a sharp student, as you know, Aaron, in this technology, not just in certain areas. You've got to know the whole thing because you're going to get screwed on one end or the other. It depends on which side of the fence you're on at that time. Yeah. It's a little noteworthy considering you didn't want to read that first Dianetics book. Oh, totally. But 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 here's what they did. The CEO member said, Joe, what do you want to achieve out of Scientology? I said, very specific. X amount of dollars to be made, speed, happiness. Da, 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 and so they said, you can achieve all of that going up the bridge. I said, okay, sold. If I'm sold a bullet bill of goods and, and I see that that's the path out, I'm going to do it. I'll move the mountain. I've right. done it all my life. So this is just another obstacle. So what's the big deal? Right. The end result was going to be valuable. So help me with the timeline here. Um, sure. I got the, the um, 80, 88, I'm sorry, sorry, 78 yep. to 83. Uh, what year did you and Carol get married? 85. Okay. All right. And then what year did you both join the Sea Org? 85. Oh, okay. But you guys got, got married, married in the Sea Org. You got married in, in the Sea the... Org. And, and we got married in the crystal ballroom on the 10th floor. Well, now I'm really confused. Yeah. So, oh, so wait. Oh, so you guys joined the Sea Org as non-spouses, but, but, but you were already a couple. Correct. Then you joined the Sea Org. Then you got married because Correct. was it... Because you had to at that point, right? You had, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was no casual relationship. <laughs> so, but then you guys have these kids. So, yep. what? What you you guys are both Sea Org members. What does that yep. mean for Danny and Chris at that point? Well, Danny and Chris live with their with their father for part of the year, and they came down with us for part of the year. Okay, schooling and back and forth. You know, their dad Peter was very accommodating, very good guy, and and then Jordan came along instantly. I so this was back I, when you could still have children in the sea. Correct. Okay. Correct. I have, they, I have never, I'm sure it's been said before. I'm sure it's been published before. I had no clue that Jordan and Alana Masterson were born into the sea organization. Yep. Well, Jordan was, Alana was born in 88. And okay. And, and, and that was after we left the sea. Org. Okay. okay. So, but Jordan, we, yeah, Jordan was born at, uh, in Mies hospital just down the road. Mies countryside. There you go. That's my my oldest daughter was born there. That's Isn't incredible. That crazy. Wow. Yeah, he he had a bit of an issue. He had those spinal bifidus uh, or whatever they call that, and I had to stay there overnight because it was not really good. Anyway, Carol couldn't deal with that, so I said no problem. I'll stay with him. And fortunately, it was he did a spinal tap and he was fine. But that was Jordan. Wow. He came uh, along. So you were in the Sea Org flag for a few. You and Carol were in for a few Two years. years. Then. Yep. Okay. So when during the part of the year that Danny and Chris would come down and, and I guess live with you guys. Yeah, that, the QI. You know where the QI is down on US 19? We would live there. Yeah, that must have sucked. They must have hated that. <laughs> <laughs> Put it this way. It wasn't a five-star hotel. How about that? <laughs> and plus, what did you guys get to see them for an hour or two a day? Or how yep, did that work? That was it. You'd, as you know, the schedule would finish at five. We'd race home, be there by 5.20. We'd have an hour, hour and 15 minutes of family time, which was either go get something to eat or sit down with the kids and then leave them and rush back to the Fort Harrison. Okay. So, yeah. da uh, so Danny and Chris had, I mean, that is an immersive Scientology experience as yeah, a young, that means at the QI, they're living with all the other Sea Org kids. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, did they go to a regular school when they would come to town or sign some Scientology homeschool stuff? 
yeah, some regular school, you know, but you know, they mainly we never they never they never joined the Sea Org. They weren't in the Sea Org, the kids themselves. Um, but you know, whatever education we did, either to a true school or local, uh, then we we did that. But when they went back to New York, they were with their father. So it was a bit of a back and forth, you know, between the kids. Wow. Okay. I'm I'm getting the picture, the the yep. best I've ever gotten it. Um yeah, sure. Okay. So then now I've heard you talk about your job in the Sea Org. What yep. was your actual post? Originally, when I joined the Sea Org, I was, I was to go into the Class 12 Auditor Program. Mm -hmm. Jeff Walker was the senior CS at the time. And he said, I'm going to put you straight through because your academics and your, the way you go through your courses and your internships and your stellar results, we're going to put you straight through because I already was a Class 5. So it's quite easy for them to just stick me on the briefing course, which I started. And then uh, I was knocking it off in a week. 10 days each level. So just no problem. And then one day I was called to the chaplain's office and, uh, and I was told to go to New York to handle uh, refunds. And I said, well, what is a refund? You know, a person wants their money back. Oh, it's the first time I ever heard that term, wanting their money back. And I said, all right, that's fine. I'll go. I thought, go to New York. Why not? I'm in flag, go to New York for a week or two. And there were six requests. And I went up there and I handled, uh, five of the six requests. And it was a huge eye opener. I met a very famous Broadway director, a very famous guitar bass builder, the, Ken Smith, good guy. And I said in Tony's uh, uh, interview the last time, I met Ed Broider. Now, Ed Broider owns all of the Oakwood apartments globally. He was, the, he was a billionaire, and I didn't even know he was a billionaire, and wanted his money back. That was kind of like the interesting interaction, Aaron. I was like, why do these people want their money? So that was how it started. Wow. So when they were sending you all over the world to handle these refund requests, yep. at some point, I guess you're no longer a class 12 auditor trainee. What did, no, what, yeah, because I got yanked out of there now. So I'm not going, now I'm like, I'm, I'm too valuable. So they just sent me everywhere. So just for the, uh, you know, the Scientologists and the former Sea Org members who are watching, sure. I like to, to give them the real lingo. What yep. was this post that you were on or was it just a project? It was just a refund request. Just refund uh, request project, under whatever. Under the KOT, the Keeper of Tech Department. Oh, under the LRH com. Okay. Yep. And and because it was a double penalty against the VSD, Aaron, at the time. I don't know if yeah. you knew that. I, I heard you say that in an earlier interview. That's insane. It, it, it really is, which meant rice and beans. And I was <laughs> like, no big deal. I, I didn't mind rice and beans, as I've said, because my mom used to make that dinner. Yeah. But it, was, uh, it got brutal. It got brutal for a while. So you and Carol, you're in the Sea Org together for a couple of years. You're doing yep. your thing. She was the DFP at Flag. Yep. Um, two HGCs, by the way. Two, not one. Two. And, and the AO HGCs or the regular yep. HGCs? AO, all the OT5 PCs. Yeah, there you go. She was very good. Now she knew how to product officer. That girl was 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 could run it. Could run a boat. No problem. You know, after spending about a month sitting next to them in the courtroom every day, I wish I'd um, known a bit more of their histories. So I sort of felt like I could understand. It's really sad in a way. We'll get into that shortly. But, you know, to, to see what they were, what they've done and their statistics as when I knew them as a father, a husband, and as a stepdad, and to kind of see it now, which is a, it's a, it's a sad event on the, on the sadness side. Whatever happened, happened. But that's, I'm just telling you, just to see it go from one extreme to another, it's a bit of an eye opener, you know? Yeah, for sure. So you and Carol, you leave the Sea Org together. Is that right? Yes. And while you guys were in the Sea Org, was Danny and Chris already getting into some sort of modeling acting stuff? Not, no. Once they were modeling and acting before we joined the Sea Org, because mm -hmm. she was running that business for the kids in New York in 1982 and 83 when I met them. Yes. And so she had a bit of a track record in Carol and managing Danny and Chris on what they call print work. They were models for the Ford agency, which is a top modeling agency in New York. Mm -hmm. And they would go into the city, do an audition, come back. You get paid $50, $75, $100. It was bread and butter money. That's what she used to do. And then that stopped, obviously, when she joined the Sea Org. And then when we left the Sea Org, we got back, we came back to Los Angeles and then got back to New York in 88, where Alana was born in, um, on Long Island. And we started back up again back into the work business. The Masterson family has a reputation for being extremely tight knit. Yep. And, and I'll tell you one, one way the family was described to me recently by someone who knows them well, Yep. is this person said, I've actually never met a group of Scientologists 
who took that concept of always being at cause, always have to be at cause, be at cause, be at cause, and, and, and took that concept so seriously and was so dedicated to it. Was that your experience back then? Can you speak to that at all? Well, to be perfectly honest, I, I think you've got to split it down. There's the gung-ho Scientology mentality and there's the Scientology mentality. What do I mean by that? The gung-ho Scientology is no matter what happens, they're never at fault. They're always right. They can't be wrong and get out of my fucking way, okay? Because I'm just going to change the galaxy, whatever their mentality is. That's pretty hard to break, right? And then you got those guys who don't do the bridge that are sort of Scientology, but they're really not applying it fully if you were really being a proper Scientologist going up the bridge, because that's the only yardstick that you, you get, you, you gauge yourself. If you're not moving up the bridge, then you're not, what are you doing? You're just sort of dabbling or you're just fiddling around at whatever level. And the kids were like that. So they weren't really gung-ho Scientologists going up the bridge. And do I think they were gung-ho Scientologists in promoting Scientology outside of it to people? No, not at all. They didn't need to. They're actors, famous, fame, travel. You know, I can tell you the, the stories, but yeah, it, it's just, it's a different mindset. And, and the reason that they were tight was their mother. She runs that family. Make no bones about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I yeah. was the when I was the father, you know, I grew up disciplined. So we did we did instill discipline and, and respect to those kids. But Carol drove that train like she ran the HGC. I mean, she ran it like an HGC with those kids. <laughs> and and so be it. So when you married Carol in eighty five, how yep. old was Danny? Danny was um, nine years old. Nine years old. How much of the year would you say, like either while you were in the Sea Org or even after, how much of the year would Danny spend with you guys versus spend with his father, Pete? Just go 50-50. 50-50. Okay, because Carol had split custody or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so you really were a genuine father figure oh, to yeah. Danny from a young oh, yeah. age. I Look, uh, and I'll just talk to you as a stepdad here, okay, when I raise him as a stepdad. What happen happens after the divorce in his life, that's his decision, good or bad, right or wrong. He lives with it. But as a kid, you know, he was very, um, very athletic, hated school, didn't like school, hated studying. I used to do his homework, him and Chris, okay, because I, I used to love math. I, I used to be a teacher, school teacher, so why not? I could love teaching, so I was fine with the kids. So academics wasn't their big thing, but I still was a part of it. Whenever they needed to go and audition, I still drove them into the city. Wherever they needed to go, I drove them. Their father was great to them. Their grandfather, Frank, was, a, was an incredible man, military guy. So you could see the inst installation of, of discipline was from, really came from inside that clan, starting with a grandfather who was a State Farm agent and a really good guy. I knew him very, very well. Big heart. And his, his wife, just a wonderful family. Actually, when I look back at it, I go, wow, what a really cool family. Uh, very cool. No problems, no upset, no entanglements, no nothing. Just solid family. You yeah. can see it. By the way, for those of you watching, if you have any questions for Joe, throw them in the chat and we'll oh, tackle them once, once, yep. once we're done with the main body of the conversation sure. here. Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> so you start you, when you got married, Danny was nine. Yep. How old was Danny when you had sort of the last um, – how do I want to word this? meaningful involvement in his life. I want to get a sense of how long sure. you were. I would say that would have been around 1998, 1999. Okay. So that would have been about when he was about 22, 23 years old. He had okay. just booked um, uh, that 70s show. Mm. And remember, if you look at that, the TV show was based on two characters, Danny and the other gentleman out of uh, Canada. Topher. But, yeah, Topher. No, but the Topher's dad in the show they were, he was in uh, Robocop, the father. And they were the two anchors in that in that TV series. And all the other actors were novices. They weren't really that, uh, you know, class A, class B. You know, they just filled in. And they held that show together. Danny done a previous show called Joe's Life the year before. We used to go to all the auditions on a Friday night taping. We used to go to all the go sees We used to do everything. So in 1998, he needed to buy a house. And I used to be in the mortgage business, finance. So I organized to get him a loan because it was very difficult because he was just still young. He was only 22, 23 years old. You know, banks don't give out mortgages to 22, 23 year olds just off the cuff. There's no history of work. There's no longevity of work. 
but I understand the mortgage business inside out. So I got the mortgage. I went with him to the closing, him and I. We sat down and we got him his house. And that's that house on Hollymont Drive, you know, the one uh, that's been mentioned in the court case. So, yeah. yeah, that's how I got to know the family, even after the divorce. You know, one question, comment, yeah. observation, speculation that people give yeah. It, uh, yeah. who don't know Scientology the way that you and I do. Sure. Uh, who don't know the ways it goes wrong and, and how people get how people get attracted in the beginning. Yep. They ask whether the behavior that we've seen from Danny. And, and by the way, I mean, let, let's be honest. He might have been convicted on two charges. At least 10 women have come forward and said oh, he's, he's done this. Wouldn't them. surprise me. A lot of people ask, did Scientology create this person? Did Scientology simply enable this person? It, did Scientology leave, leave Danny to think this behavior was okay? Did it just create an environment where he knew he couldn't get caught? I'd like to get your thoughts on on those kind of questions. Well, I, I think of, of all the people that would have a really good insight to it, it would be me because I was on both sides of the refunds, the pissed off people, the guys that were promiscuous, the guys that said, fuck you to the church. The guy, I mean, I've seen it all. OK, so it, what what baffled me in the refunds, and this is kind of what was interesting to me, uh, is that I knew that these people wanted their money back and I, and I wanted to know why. I didn't care who was right and who was wrong. I just wanted to know what the truth was. And once you get to the truth, then you can resolve the problem. But if you lie about it, you can't resolve shit. So in the case of refunds, if I found out what the guy was doing, for example, let's say there was a guy named, uh, let's call him Victor Hurtado. I'll give you his name, out of Mexico. $180,000 refund request. It's a lot of money, okay? I was sent to Mexico to fix this guy. Guy doesn't speak a word of English. He's regged for 180 grand. His account was debited for what we call gross book sale profits. And he never <laughs> authorized any of that. I could go into that story. He wanted his money back, but he was suing the church. So after getting an interpreter and, and breaking it down, the guy had received psychiatric treatment when he was 11. And he'd been under the ECT thing for three years. And they knew it. Oh, and they no. still regged him for all the money, knowing all too well he was never going to use that money. Because as you know, you're not eligible for auditing. What are you eligible for? Training. So he, so he showed up to take the services he paid for, and they're like, you're not qualified to take these services. I, I, I could give you 30 of those stories. And I'm in the middle of it. All right? So I'm thinking, why did we do that to this guy? Because they're driven by money. They're not driven by reality. Policy might be one thing, but the money overrides policy all the time. And that's why they sent me out there to fix the people, to not give them back their money. Right. But when I was dealing with that in 86, there was hundreds of refund requests into the tens of millions of dollars. Hmm. Remember, Flag at that time, Aaron, was doing $2 million a week. I was there watching that gross income being booked. $2 million a week in 85, 86 is a lot of money. One million of it was coming out of Europe from their FSC office. The other million was coming out of the US, Australia, and so forth. So it was a big money maker. But now you're getting money refunds. Not a good idea. Yeah. So, I mean, that gives you perspective, you know, on both sides of it, like where it Correct. can go right, where it can go wrong. What yep. about this issue of people wondering how much responsibility does Scientology bear for what Danny became and did? What is your take on this? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, 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 a lot of it squares on Danny because he's the one that pulled the trigger, if you know what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're allowed to pull the trigger, then you're going to pull the trigger. And in the church, they turned a blind eye to him. I know because I've done it to so many other people that I had to go and sort out. Okay, why? because they'd rather not have the public relations nightmare of a pissed off high, high roller, whether he's a celebrity as an actor or famous or whether he's a big donor guy because they're driven by the money. So the, the compromise of a two, two tier justice system was way prevalent in Scientology. And I knew the big whales in Scientology that got away with literally <laughs> unbelievable criminality because the church turned a blind eye because they already got their money. You see? Right. If, if he didn't have the money and he was he was giving him a hard time, then they'd come after him. But because he was a status guy from the money side, mm -hmm. they left him alone. If he was a status guy from the celebrity side, as in an actor or a singer, 
the same treatment. So what did that really do? They just turned a blind eye to it. Now, if I would have done that, and I'm saying this young plea that just, you know, was, you know, fooling around or did something, they'd be hauling me over the, the charcoals. Right. Because they couldn't give a shit. So I guess we're sort of talking about the classic nature or nurture question. Was Danny right. created this way or was he made this way? Um, and, and and I don't know that it has to be all of one or the other. No, so, I think that if you, it's like anything. If you let if you steal a lolly and you think you got away with it, then you go fine. You think, well, hey, if I got away with stealing a lolly, could I steal something bigger? So then you steal something bigger and you get away with it. So well, you know, you just it just keeps driving you down that dwindling hole or, you know, down into the abyss where you think you're just above the law. And right. you can't do that. And when the church doesn't do anything about it, because you're this quote unquote opinion leader or or a value, they're not going to upset the apple cart until it blows up. Right. And then now they're brought into it. You see? Yeah. You know, I've got I've got some business Scientologists that I know, even the Reed Slackett. I know Reed very well. I did business with Reed. I had to sort Reed out with a couple of business issues. Look what happened to him. Hmm. So was Reed, is that an example of a guy who got away with totally. a couple of things? He got away with shit even before his big Ponzi scheme blew up. Wow. Reed was doing shenanigans. Look, my kids had their money with Reed Slacken. And I was doing an arbitration with Reed Slacken and Richie Okunto. If you know who Richie Okunto is, he was my very close friend. He went down the wrong road of criminality that the church allowed him to get away with because he, he brought so many people to the org. So he got away with it. Okay. Unfortunately, he passed away. I feel bad because he wasn't a bad guy, you know? But he was enabled. He could get away with it because who's going to take him down? Okay, I couldn't take him around the street and bash him. I'd go get arrested. Okay, for smacking him around for doing something wrong. I couldn't do that. And the church said, no big deal. Leave him alone. Right. So when you, know, you got that, when you got that covering you, Aaron, it's a big difference. Did it enable him to to press the envelope? Of course it did. Of course right. it did. Was Dan, other than the specific types of crimes that he's now going to prison for, yep. was Danny the type of kid or teen or young adult who was just kind of always getting into trouble? No, not at all. Hmm. No, I'm telling you, he was a mischievous kid. You know, I was a mischievous kid at school, but I wasn't intentionally a harmful person to say that Danny was in drugs and so forth. Absolutely not. Did he do teenage stuff? Who doesn't, Right. But was he like a caught up with the law and police and no, none of that. Yeah. Good kid. I'm telling you, good kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why yeah. his family, his brothers, Jordan and Alana and Chris, are loyal to him because he was like a big brother to them, but also indirectly like a father figure. And people need to understand it. So the question I've always I always had is where did it go wrong with this guy? Okay? Because he's responsible for the condition he's in. Now, had I had the opportunity to fix him, I would have fixed him because that's what I do. That's what I do with my son, Jordan, in 2003. Remember that day, 2003. I was asked to intervene to sort my son out because he was getting audited and sec checked at Celebrity Center and they were fucking him over. My ex said, Joe, you're the only one that can fix guys like this. I said, sure, he's my son. I'll fix him. Fixed him. 50 hours of sort out, done. I was going to do that with Danny. Never got that opportunity because the church got pissed off. Why? Because I bypassed the church and sorted out their product. This is where I can't win. They should have said, Joe, you're good. Let's please come and help this guy. Come and help this guy because we're not, we're not getting through. You get through. I don't know what you do. Do it. No way. Showing them up. So was See? Jordan was Jordan getting into um his own Jordan's messes going down and the same road as my son and my stepson Danny? Big time. Mm. now that would and, have been a bigger story you understand and, and so scientology was they were sex checking him they were trying what were they doing Just, were they trying to sex handle him, him? him and missing everything uh, and so i come along i've come i come in through the back door out that's what i used to do with all the refunds i said listen man i don't care who's right or wrong and i don't blame you that you want your money back i just would like to know the truth and then once i realized i wasn't making them wrong or pissing on them or making them feel like they're criminal when it's their money then I wanted to communicate. And yeah. once they communicated, I said, Joe, we like you, man. You know what? We don't want to do Scientology. Keep the money. We're fine. We don't want to do it, but we're fine. Wow. Right. P fine. Perfect. 
right 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 you see what i mean so this is because they never got to the truth they always were blaming the person because he wanted his money back well, why don't you find out why he wants his money back yeah. so in the case of my my stepson danny if he wasn't doing good why didn't you sit him down and go listen dan you're on the wrong track here man you need to get sorted out oh no we can't sort you out because you're a celebrity that doesn't work no, it's backfired it's totally backfired on that kid right um <clears throat> sure that makes sense yeah yeah, there's something, there's an aspect to, there's an aspect to all of this that I've been unable to resolve for myself. I just want to uh, chew on it with you a bit. Sure. In the world of Scientology, as you yep. know, yep. people are not shy about admitting and acknowledging that um, everyone does bad things. I mean, sure. it. It's, it's almost one of the most fundamental principles of Scientology is uh, yep. all of our overts and withholds are the root cause of yep. our shortcomings and only by confronting those yep. things. And, and Scientologist has a whole thing of you need to raise your confront of evil. Stop pretending like people don't do really evil Correct. things. Everybody does evil things. Correct. Raise your raise your confront of evil is a is a very often repeated phrase in Scientology. Yeah. With what happened with Jane Doe 1 and with all this sec checking that Danny got and Jane Doe 1 got and Luke Watson got, Scientology knew, and by extension, every one of Danny's family members knew, that he damn well did what Jane Doe 1 accused him of. Nobody right. was under any illusion. Scientologists right. don't walk around with their head in the clouds about this shit. Not someone yeah. who's experienced as Carol as having been the DFP of the flag AO for yep. two years. Like, get the hell yep. out of here. Totally. She knows what Danny did, but in Scientology, you go, okay, you 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 do your lower conditions, you get off your overts and withholds, whatever. Yep. You you don't condemn someone for their acts. Yep. What I've been having trouble coming to terms with is how okay. Carol, knowing that Danny had already done this to one person, knowing that he almost certain the other women weren't making it up, it would be a, a too yep. much of a coincidence. Yep. How she could sit there in court every single day listening to the testimony of the horrible things Danny did to these women and sit there with a smile on her face like she was an auditor in session keeping her TRs in. I right. cannot put myself in the headspace. I can, I've can. i tried. Yep. I cannot put myself into her perspective on, on being able to sit there every day and listen to this shit and thinking, yep. you think you're supporting Danny by sitting there? I think it would be supporting Danny by not showing up and forcing uh, – listening to all this shit yep. how can every member of that family go to court every day and listen to these women who they know are telling the truth yeah say all these horrible things what i i can't understand it you know it's it's a great point and i tell you it's a great point and and i think the the idea is the love that they have for this kid i'm telling you the love they have for this kid danny he could do anything and i still wouldn't see it understand the loyalty and love is so blind good or bad right or wrong the fact that you can't confront is the biggest issue here at the end of the day the condition is as mr hubbard would say you know the state you find yourself in is the answer whether you've done right or wrong okay and and, and that's about the and that and that shuts everyone the fuck up okay <laughs> Because it's like, well, I didn't do anything. Well, well, let's look at the state you find yourself in, RJ36, okay? Well, what is it? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm fucked up. Okay, well, I guess you did wrong. End of story. So shut the fuck up. Take your medicine, as we say in rugby. You're going to get hit? Get hit. Take it. Get broken arm, but whatever. But take your medicine. The more you deny the truth, the worse it gets. Right. So you think them showing up wasn't necessarily an indication that they didn't believe these women. It was just to support him. Totally. Yeah. And of course, of course, as we know, Scientologists, even if they know Danny did that, would not support a Scientologist being sent to prison. So they're still hoping he's yep. going to be found not guilty or there's going to be a mistrial. Yep. And then everything can go back into the Scientology world and stop being yeah, dragged into the Sweep it under the carpet. Right. Okay, right. but so to answer your original point about the disservice, I'm telling you, of, of anyone that's handled the out ethics of so many people in Scientology, I'm the only guy that's, that's got a whole array of it, that I've seen it. And I've seen it on the group side, because groups are not loyal to individual members, but they want the individual members to be loyal to the group until, it, until you don't serve their need, then they say, fuck off, get the fuck out of here. Okay, 
So in, in the case of, of Danny, he was loyal to them because he was a PR figure. Okay? Does that mean he audited people? Does that mean he went into session and, and made 20 clears or 100 clears? I did all that. And that's the only value to me if you're a Scientologist, quote unquote, is be an auditor and, and, and make people clear if that's the game. Not to be a, a, a guy that donates money. That's the elite game. Well, hang on, that's bullshit. <laughs> so they did not do him any service. And his mom probably uh, covered for him. You know what I'm saying? Because it was like, you know, he didn't want to upset the apple cart. Too fucking bad. Right. We all had to do it. We all had to do the bridge. We had to do suffer. We had to do our training. We had to pay all the money. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? And because yeah. that's how it works. You know, a lot, I've seen a lot get made about Danny's lack of bridge progress, but I yep. honestly think it's different for first generation members than it is for second generation members. Okay. Don't and I, th I think you sprinkle a little more on top of that when you throw in the fact that he was a celebrity. I mean, well, yeah. Joe, like I spent the ages of from 12 to 26 working full time for Scientology. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I, I read your stuff, man. Yeah. I'm a pure of completion. <laughs> I've never done the, uh, the objectives. I've never done the drug rundown. I've never done the HRD. Wow. I've never had an objective session. Well, yeah. Yep. But I've had a ton of sec checking. I've had FPRD. I've done yep. Pro TRs, Clay Table, yep. KTL, LOC, Clay Table. I've had a I've dozen. Yeah, yep. A, yep. A, a dozen, a dozen in rundowns. A, a, yep. You know, L1Cs, um, quad roots and over. It's all this shit. I've L4 I don't know. BRBs, the whole uh, thing. Up, up the ass. But you could never have told me I wasn't a dedicated Scientologist, or I didn't right. believe. Right. And and one thing, uh, this came up when I was chatting, chatting with someone else recently is. You know, oftentimes what one of the things that that um, precipitates being sent to ethics yep. is if a reg is trying to hard sell you for something yep. and yep. you spit out a bunch of disaffection or enemy lines to them. The yep. reg then reports you to the ethics officer. The ethics officer pulls you in. And this is how you sort of end up being pushed up the bridge because the ethics officer and the reg are kind of tag teaming you. Oh, totally. But with totally a celebrity, to do, by the way, but they do it anyway. <laughs> but with a celebrity, you're not allowed to reg them like that. Nope. Nope. So you don't have the reg, uh, and uh, through through these high pressure tactics, sort of causing you to spit out these enemy lines, which is the reasons you don't really want to go up the bridge. And right. then it gets tossed over to the ethics officer, who yep. then handles you. So a second gen member like Danny, who like me, yep. might might have liked the idea of full OT, but didn't really like the idea of getting yeah, yeah, auditing. Totally. Yeah, totally. And you add on top of that that the regs aren't really allowed to reg him. Nope. There's no real inertia to push Danny Masterson. And, up and the there's no ethics officer to put his ethics in. Right. So hang on. It's like a free, it's, it's get out of jail card, free and monopoly. And if he does get in a little bit of trouble, it gets yep. dealt with by the president's office, not the ethics officer primarily. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> we call it breastfeeding. <laughs> That's all it is 24 7. That's easy. And so I when I that. hear that these second gen celebrity guys don't go yeah. up the bridge a lot, I go, that's my, that, that sounds normal to me. That doesn't have any reflection on. on their dedication to Scientology. Spot on. Spot on. Yeah. And I think, I think back then in the seventies and eighties, Scientology was very new. There was no internet. There was no lawsuits. You couldn't find in Australia, you couldn't find one legal document on Scientology. Okay. So when the 96 came along with the golden era of tech number with the new revamp, Okay, then people started to go, well, this is a bunch of bullshit, man. I've got to do it all over again. I've got to do the whole bridge all over again. I've got to buy a new meter. I've got to put a quantum to it. 600 bucks, this under bucks, 20 grand. Now I'm up for another 50 grand for doing what? Because we have to fix the system. Well, hang on a second. Who's got $50,000 just to throw at the bridge at, 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 the, at, at any whim? And so the kids are saying, well, here we go. More in debt. We can't go anywhere. People are doing the bridge. So you know what? I'm just going to go play tic-tac-toe. <laughs> and this is the, that's that's the flavor if that makes sense yeah. very rare to find gung-ho guys today so in your opinion yeah. was carol carol was as um did she get up to ot7 like you no she got to ot5 and then i think she ended up doing ot7 later would you say she's about as dedicated of a scientologist as you've ever met dedicated i would say that um initially um when i first met them they were her and pete pete wasn't as Okay, he's kind of like a little bit 50-50 uh, on it, if you know what I'm saying. He's just not as gung-ho, but that's okay. Good guy, supported his family in Scientology, didn't care. But Carol was. 
but out of the three, I was the I was the gung ho guy, <laughs> and so that sort of set a precedent. But Carol was very good. You know, she loved the technology. Hmm. Was she a trained auditor? No. Nah. Do you think any of what has gone down here? Yep. Has would would it have any impact on either Carol's or the other members of the family's dedication or commitment to Scientology? I think it's going to throw a big curveball. It has to, because now at the end of the day, look at it. Uh, uh, I'm going to lose my brother, the kids. I'm going to lose my brother. Or I'm going to lose my son for 20, 30 years, hopefully, whatever it is. He's, that's not a good life to look forward to, but it is what it is. And now the kids are going to go, why am I doing the bridge? For what reason? I've lost my dad. But I don't know why I lost my dad, because the church told me they've got to disconnect from the father because Joe Reese is an evil person. So I've got to disconnect from him. So I lost my brother. I lost my dad. My mother's not going to live for too long. Now what do I do? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I feel Carol's likely to die of a broken heart here. To, I mean, oh, if you ask big me. Time. Listen, Danny was her golden child. No mm. question about it. And Jordan was number two. Mm. So that's why it was. it's tough on her. I feel for her as a mother. I do. Not easy. No matter yeah. what. So I can understand her position. Whether he's done it or not, she's going to look at the truth versus her love. And you've got to separate the two. How did Scientology um, get your kids, Jordan and Alana, to disconnect from you? What happened? Oh, uh, but the, these motherfuckers are just unbelievably evil. They're just evil. You're going to talk about evil? Then they're evil. They might have something to sell that's spiritual, but their functionality is evil. And I'll tell you how they did it. I won't go into the community of evidence court martial, which was a bunch of bullshit. It doesn't mean that I was right, that I was perfect, but I was trying to be perfect in an imperfect world. Example, I did something that was the greatest good for the greatest number. So I thought, oh, that's pretty good. But then over here, they said, well, no, that's not really good because that's not good. But hang on, but you over, over here, you said it was the greatest good, but now it's not. Well, which one is it? Well, how does it benefit? If it benefits you, it's fine. So when, as you know, when you build up an ethics file, you can build up an ethics file in three months. And me being a mischievous kind of person, okay, I had too many statistics of good products, sorting out people. They, uh, they, there was a file over here that said a lot of opinion reports, you know, the ones with opinions. I think Joe Reese is antagonistic because he told me that I'm, I need to lose weight or something. Okay, well, you need to lose weight. What's the problem here? The truth's the truth. You're 150 pounds overweight. You got upset? Shut the fuck up. Lose the weight. No, I get sent to ethics, right? Why did you do that? Because he asked me about an opinion, so I gave him my opinion. <laughs> So, so you want me to tell him that he looks fantastic when he's 150 pounds overweight? I'm not going to violate my integrity. Anyway, so cut a long story short, there are some business deals that went sour. But people think that Joe took all the money and bought a Ferrari and went to the drugs and went to, you know, to, to, the, to, the, to the Afghanistan and sold hash. No, we were giving it to other Scientologists. They lost the money, but because I set up the deal, I got shot. Okay, fine. I'll take that. No big deal. No victim. So when that ethics file goes up, they went, you know what? This guy, you know, he can't be told what to do. No, I'm just competent with the tech. I just couldn't be pushed over. You pushed everyone over because you used the tech. I said, yeah, but that policy, da, 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 says this. And that policy is this. So what policy are you using against me? You're totally wrong. Remember, you've got to know the tech. They don't like people knowing the tech because then they could checkmate them. That becomes a ping pong match. Okay? So, Joe, when all these business deals were going sour or, or whatever, you're, I don't want to. Just a few do. of them. Just give them a few. But I mean, like during this period of your life, yeah. um, are you still in the States or are you back in Australia? I'm in the States. Okay. Okay. So once you came to the States, you stayed in the States. That's it. I love America. Okay. okay. So America. your XSO, but Carol's XSO, was this, was this still back? Was, uh, had they already, uh, was there already a culture where being XSO made you like sort of a perpetually bad person? Oh yeah, totally. We were considered okay. the DBs or the degraded beings. And then we had to do the liability formula and then we had to go to the, to flag and get our signatures for 400 staff during okay. lunch hours and dinner times, embarrassing yeah, as fuck. Yeah. Let me tell you, ridiculous. Okay. So every time, every time you get in a little bit of trouble, they're pulling up your phone. They're like, "Up oh, XSO, oh, yeah. we there know we what go. we're dealing yeah. with. Here right. we go again." Yeah. yeah, but instead of saying, "Now hang on a second, Mister Hubbard says if a guy's got an ethics file, you got to look at this production record. Don't look at these ethics files. Let's look at this production record. If the production record is 150 to one against the ethics file." Blow it off. What's the big deal? No, they ignored that. They didn't care about that anymore. They just wanted to go for the go for the guy, no matter what. But so with Carol knowing you as she did for as long yep. as she did, with you being yep. such a presence in not yep. only your own kids' lives, but your yep. stepkids' lives, 
Yep. How did they get your kids to disconnect from you? Well, here's what they did. When they did the COMEV, it was in January of 2005. And as you know, in the COMEV policies, which I'm very familiar with, you've got seven days to issue it, turn it around and flip it out with the FNRs, findings and recommendation. Seven days. Why? Because if you don't, then it becomes a witch hunt. All right? They didn't do that. And Joe, this COMEV was for the business stuff? No, this is just COMEV, just period. Just to sort out the truth from the lies. Of regarding the business stuff? Anything. Well, no, a comment has to be called for a reason, though. Oh, just basically reports, you know, basically business or, you know, Scientology contributions or lack of contributions, just to generalize uh, reports that came. And I had to go there okay. to sort them out. So okay. I said, no, let me go sort them out. No problem. So they, they'd written the report. They did the hatchet job. It was at 11 o'clock at night till 2 in the morning, you know, outside the, you know, the Fort Harrison. I had to wait. And they had these tabs on the folders already. They had the file already there and they had these little tabs sticking out, A, B, C. I'm thinking, wow, these guys are knowing exactly where they want to go to ask the questions. So I realized then that uh, I'm on the target list, okay? No matter what I did, no matter what I said, these guys already tagged me to be declared. I knew that. But I had one thing up my sleeve, seven days. Got to do it and get it back in seven days. Weeks go by and months go by. I wrote to Greg Wilhair. Remember Greg? Mm -hmm. Knew Greg very, very well. I was his number one FSM in Australia in 1983. They forgot all about those production records. Um, and no answer. And so in July, June of June the 10th, 11th, I get a, uh, a phone call from the CJC in the flag, you know, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so I said, uh, we've got your FNRs. I said, you're four months late. That policy doesn't work. I said, no, we've got your FNRs. I said, that's fine. I said, when am I getting them? You're getting them tomorrow. Okay, well, fine. They didn't come the next day. I waited two days. I called my kids, called all my friends, 40, 50 of them, just to say hi. No one answered. For two days, Aaron, no one spoke. Children, friends. Third day, I get the FNRs hand delivered to where I was living. Suppressive to person declared. Hmm. I went, fuck, now I know what they've done. They all found out I was, except I wasn't, which gave them enough time to sort out the kids, sort out the family, get it all set up, and then tell me after the fact. Now, that's very standard, don't you think? It is standard, but it also shows that Carol not only turned on you, but cooperated in turning all the kids on you over oh, yeah. something yeah, no greater than Scientology said you were no longer a good guy. Yeah. Like it wasn't due to anything that you had done to her or the kids or anything. No, and this, no, no, this no, is no, nothing to do with it. This is how this is how Scientologists and, work. And I'll be perfectly honest. And and the reason that you know she snitched on it when I told her I sorted out my son Jordan in back yeah. in two thousand three. Mm. I had, I had designed my own program to sort out people with ethics. And what it was, I used a little bit of technology. I used my own data. I got into discipline, training, health, and so forth, and I fixed someone. And I fixed my son, Jordan. I got to the root of his, his integrity issue because I just want to let everyone know and the viewers here, here's what happens. Scientology can't fool anyone unless you violate your integrity. And once you do that once, it's over. You now go down the slippery, slippery slide called manipulation and being moved around like a pawn. And that's what they do. So when I did that to my son and fixed him, I got back his integrity, got back in violence or back to his real true personality, got rid of the dramatization of what he was doing and all the promiscuity that he was doing and all the bullshit that they were doing. And he said, dad, you saved my life. I said, no problem, son. I love you. Carol took those, those documents, my worksheets and sent them to flag and said that I was squirreling the tech. That's what I was going to ask you. And Did that they... came up in the comment. Oh, oh my God. In Scientology. And I went, what a fucking, the next word comes, starts with B. I said, wow, there you so go. She, so she was already saying that you had oh, no, she on Jordan. No, no, she was gung ho for that. Well, Whether that answers wanted... the question I was going to ask you. I was going to say, Joe, do you have any idea who you pissed off? Because you pissed someone off. Oh, it was her. You pissed off Carol. Oh, yeah, totally. And when she... you piss off Carol, she just she just take you out. Wow. You, you, can, you know, you can ask, you can ask Jane Doe three. She'll tell you about her. Yeah. I know Jane Doe three very well. <laughs> I did an ethics cycle on Jane Doe three. See, I know all the stuff there. So they are got to be very careful with me because what are you going to hurt me? I was but, they war. but they haven't been careful with you. Well, well, what are they going to do? You're going to intimidate me. I play rugby man. 
you're going to hurt me. I, I, I was in a war. Um, yeah, I'm going to die. I'm prepared to die. Uh, it doesn't. What, what you, I got nothing to lose. I'm the dog that's been kicked. Yeah. Now the dog's coming back. He's no longer the dog. He's the lion. Okay. So it it, it shows you a lot about it. It it, it tells you a lot about Carol. Oh so yeah. Once, totally. once she decided you needed to be gone, she got you gone. Oh yeah. And then when she needed my help for the children, I was the best person in the world because no one who could fix the kids. See, it was use me until I need me and then piss on me when I don't. And I'm not saying it that she's an evil person. She's going to deal with her, her actions, good or bad, right now. Okay? I wouldn't want to be in her shoes, no matter how much money you gave me and no matter how much celebrityism I've got. I don't want that tag on my footstep. Not with my family. Mm-hmm. Okay? That's all out the window now. Yeah. After you got declared, did you ever have any contact with Carol or any of the kids again? Nope. Yep. Phone oh. calls, Christmas cards, gifts, nothing. Sent them Eight, out, no return, nothing. 18 years. 19 years. 18, 19 years. Yep. Only way I know my, my daughter's alive is I see it on Google. I get a Google of Alana or Jordan. Yeah. I'm proud of them. I think Carol did a great job in managing them. Yeah. But that's a job responsibility. And for those of you watching who may not know, Jordan Masterson is in, um, well, Last Man Sta- was in Last Man Last Standing. Last Man Standing with Tim Allen. And um, Alana Masterson, more, most recently, has been in The Walking Dead. Yeah, so a few, six, six seasons. Yeah, Chris Masterson was in Malcolm in the Middle, and Dana Correct. Masterson, everyone probably. Yeah, the, mo- look, the, the most famous family in the world is the Masterson family with celebrityism. You got four kids with four series. Yeah. The, the next that come after that are Baldwin brothers and and the Hemsworth brothers. That's it. Mm. <laughs> so we're ahead of the game here. We just got knocked back down. We just got a TKO here. Okay from the clan, all right, with yeah. what happened. Yeah. So she did some great work as a mom, as a manager, yeah, but did a terrible disservice to him bridge-wise, and she should have come down on him tough. Yeah. Are you – do you consider yourself an independent Scientologist? No. Okay. So you don't mess I with that. I consider myself Jair Rish, and, 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 and that's it. You're independent? Perfect. You're a terrorist? Perfect. You're a Lebanese? No, perfect. no, but I mean, do you still do Scientology no. outside of Scientology? Nope. Okay. I'm focused now on business. I'm focused on staying healthy and I'm, I help a lot of people. I do my programs to help people to get back to some normalcy, sort out their life. Cause I'm, I'm a, I'm a pay it forward kind of guy. You know, you need some help. I'm going to help you. Why not yeah. sort out your business? I'll sort you out. I'll do this. No problem. Yeah. I don't have any, uh, you know, back off and, you know, I didn't get, I'm good with it all, you know? So now that Danny Masterson's going to prison, do you yep. think uh, Scientology will declare him a suppressive person and expel Absolutely him? not. I agree They're with They're going to cover their ass because, as I said before, you don't want five Leah Remini's because that family will turn. Yes. They'll, they will turn. Look, Carol can be can be ruthless, but can go both ways. Mm-hmm. She can be ruthless against you and she'll be ruthless against your enemy. Don't want to be her enemy. She don't care. And that's right. fine. But pick your enemies. So that's, that's the right <laughs> one, not the wrong ones. That's pretty much been my take on it as well. Like Danny is already the lowest of the low right now. Let, if I'm Scientology, if I'm a scavenge, yep. I'm going, it, it could still get worse though. You could still have oh, all yeah. these guys going after Scientology. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Listen, wh- whatever happens to them, that's totally fine with me. Okay. They've got their shortcomings coming to them. Okay. Cause their hands are not clean. Period. Danny's hands are not clean. He's now paying that price. Good or bad, right or wrong. Okay. But to hide behind the truth and lie and piss on people because you think you can get away with it. No, that's not going to work because life catches up with you. You want to to call it karma, whatever. It's going to catch up to you. Okay. Yeah. Because you can't get away with it. If that was the case, then, then, then being criminal would be the greatest thing to do because you can get away with literally anything that that wouldn't be right. That would just invalidate everything about life. Right. There has to be one little seed germinating in the minds of the other members of the Masterson family, which is absolutely, I think that seed has to be, and I don't know if I'm giving them too much credit, but I think that seed is there of Scientology didn't fix Danny. And he went and did this to many women in different States, in different countries, Scientologists, non-Scientologists, Scientology didn't fix him and look where it got him. That yep. has to be sitting there in their minds. 
Well, how about I add to that? How about that they've, they've let others, other like a Danny, get away with whatever? How many of those have they like to got away with? I've gotten people who've written me stories and said, Joe, I want to thank you. I said, for what? This is because it's now brought the attention that when I was in the sea, or I got molested, I got raped, I got whatever. And I'm like, oh, man, this has been going on for 30, 40, 50 fucking years. And they knew about it and they didn't address it. So it's repeating itself. That yeah. to me is evil, Aaron. This is the evil of that. Okay? Yeah. Period. And the hierarchy has got to take responsibility for it. Right. They're the captain of the football ship. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to keep continuing. But now All right. There's, the there's a, a handful of questions here for you. Um, sure. Lori Plays says, thanks for talking with us. Do you think Carol and the kids genuinely think Danny is innocent or are they just sticking with him no matter what? We did touch on this, but just. Yeah, the, they're just going to stick with him. Yeah. Even now, and I, I would go so far and I'm curious if you agree with me. Sure. Not only do they not necessarily think he's innocent, they know he did it. They know he that uh, Joe, uh, okay, since you were a fixer, there is no way Scientology lets Danny Masterson enter into a four hundred thousand dollars civil settlement and agreement with Jane Doe One unless they are saying, Yes, Danny did this. We need to lock this up. So this yeah, let's, just, let's just let's just let's just handle it. Let's just resolve it. Yeah. <laughs> Because if the they top. if they determined it hadn't occurred, they never would have let Jane Doe one take four hundred thousand dollars from Danny. Okay, let's flip it. You're right. Let's flip the other way around. Let's say the church had to pay out the money. So we're not paying it because we didn't do anything wrong. You think they're gonna pay out the money to settle it? No, they're not gonna pay it because they didn't do anything wrong. But right. if you pay the money, then you've got to have some admit of guilt or some type of responsibility connected to it. That's they right. And this isn't point. even us just speculating because the fact no, is I get it. Jane Doe one, meaning uh Jane we already know that Scientology knows they did it. And Carol, I didn't know Carol had been a flag AOD of P. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. She knows that P Scientologists do this shit. Of course. <laughs> she knows the sex checking Danny received and the lower conditions and, you know, the people they pulled in. They even pulled in Reverend Alfredi Johnson to try to help Danny sort of come to terms with and admit that yeah. what he had done was, in fact, Right. Rape. So they right. even pulled in opinion leaders to try to get Danny's head straight. <laughs> Carol enough. knows that. They know he sure. did this. Um, okay, Mark Andrew um Demarest. It sounds like Danny may have ADHD. Has anyone broached the topic? Yeah, nobody would have ever broached that topic. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's just something that doesn't exist in Scientology. No. Nah. No. Yeah. So if you want to define what ADHD means, depending on the interpretation of that concept, right? Mm -hmm. You know, was he was he uh, focused on just certain things in life? Yes. Was he all over the place? Not necessarily. He's pretty focused on what he wanted to do as an athlete, as a, a as an actor. He was pretty centered on what he wanted. You know, not much of a not much of a headache as a kid growing up. You know what I mean? And he was. Uh, I can tell you. Yeah. All right, Kat, ACDC fan. Do you think Danny's family ties are strong within their Scientology beliefs? If we're to believe their, their money may be all that protects Danny in prison. So, Joe, this is referring to the idea that the only thing that's going to protect Danny is whether he's able to pay rent on some of the yards that he's in. And would Danny's family pay that rent to keep to, to secure his safety? Or would they go, Danny, save us all a lot of trouble and drop the body? What, what do you think? Oh, I, no, 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 no. Dan, Danny, Danny won't do that. Danny will, will play it all out. But will his family pay rent on the outside to keep Danny safe? Or will it be like, Danny, you're really creating a problem for us. You know. Oh, no, no, no. They'll jump in and help. Okay. They'll, 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 they'll do it no matter what. Okay. All right. Joshua Cox. Great interview. Aaron loved it. Joe, I appreciate your honesty. I cannot Thanks, imagine Joshua. the pain. I cannot imagine the pain you're going through. Keep your head Well, up. Josh, I'll, I'll tell you something, man. Here's something that, that's real to me. Um, it, it's sad to lose your kids, okay? But you don't have to understand my upbringing. I grew up in a tough environment, very abusive family, civil war, death, snipers, artillery shells, discrimination. I could, I could write a book about it, which I'm going to. So to me, it's like, that's life. So long as I'm alive and healthy and I'm helping others, okay, and, and contribute so that things like that don't happen again, then I feel like I've, I've some value to someone. Otherwise, if I have no value, then what, what, what am I pointing out here? Okay, yeah. self, self pain, too bad, Joe. Suck it up, get on with it, play football, whatever. Get bashed, get on with life, move, keep moving. That's the only way out of it. How many, 
you you alluded to this earlier in the interview in the very beginning. Um, yeah. what what was the deal with the civil war you're talking about? Beirut civil war during the Christian Palestinian conflict. Uh, I was 14 years old. I, I unfortunately, I had to grow up with weapons and guns and snipers and bombings and artillery shells and death. My friends were killed in wars. There was tough times between the Christian militia and the Muslim militia. I grew up in that. So are you, were you born in Australia or were you born in born Australia? My dad decided to leave in 1972 to go back to the homeland. It took wow. me away from my career as football, my academics, all my friends to go live in a third world country. I was like, what the fuck? I've got to go learn this Arabic language. I couldn't even speak a word of it. And then my whole career in football was gone. My friends were gone because I had to go to a third world country. Well, four years later, I was playing f professional football at 19 years old. So you want to talk about destiny, okay? Life said, hey, Joe, don't worry about it. We'll turn it all around. And I wow. fulfilled my objective. So, so when I look at that, I go, well, okay, this is rough. Sure, I haven't seen the kids in 19 years. Okay, maybe I do one day, maybe I don't. But I'm not, I'm not going to walk around being a victim. Right, right, right. Period. Amazing. Thanks. All right. Su Susie Q says, might Danny have been abused by someone in Scientology? I know it's not an excuse, but I wonder if something awful happened to him. No, I, I don't think that. I, I would think more than anything else. It's like if you get away with something and no one says anything, you just try a little bit further. And then, as you know, Aaron, I have to tell you, you're talking Hollywood here, man. Mm -hmm. The most promiscuous evil facility in the galaxy when it comes to moral codes. Okay and manipulation in that field, especially with stardom. So, you know, and, and unfortunately the girls, either or, depending on how you look at it, are going to just try and ratchet up numbers with men. I've seen it. I used to do it when I was a professional athlete. There were women everywhere. I didn't go down that road because I grew up Catholic. I, hey, what, why are we doing that? I don't want to do that. That's There was a bit of a moral upbringing that we had, and it was just wrong to do. So he wouldn't have done that. Uh, he would have just gotten away with it. And then they said, turn a blind eye. Hmm. And, and I, I know too many Scientology celebrities that have done that and gotten away with it. Yeah. No one cares. Cinnamon Whiskey says, I'm in watching you talk with Tommy Scoville. I believe I saw some empathy. If I'm right, I had some too, because no human being should be subjected to that. Joe, I did an interview with um, a guy named Tommy Scoville who did okay. 13 years in the prison system. And uh, he said the worst prison experience you could possibly have is as a white male sex offender in the California prisons. He said oh, there's, yeah. there's nothing there that he couldn't have picked a worst place to go, a, a worse offense to have been convicted of and, and a worse skin color. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and it does make me wonder. I've tried to, you know, just like I said earlier, I try, you know, try to put myself in, in Carol's headspace and see if I could. Yep. see if I could get there. I don't see Danny Masterson living the next 30 plus years in those conditions. Yeah, it's tough. Voluntarily, I mean, yeah, willing, yeah. willingly. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Um, okay, another one from Cinnamon Whiskey. What would Danny's stepdad have done if David Miscavige humiliated or slapped him? He's the only person I've watched that I don't think would have taken it. Who, Danny? No, 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 no. What would you have done, Joe, if David Miscavige had humiliated or slapped him? Well, this is a PG-13 episode, uh, Aaron, so I'll just leave it as PG-13. You don't want to go to the R-rated version, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave it there. Remember, I grew up in a war, man. Death. I've seen it all. I've watched it all. I've been a part of it. Uh, evil and death are nothing to me. It's nothing. It's like, okay, next. Yeah. What it is. All right, everyone. Um, that's uh, that's what we've got here. Joe, I really appreciate your perspective hey, on all this. Listen, I, I, and I appreciate you bringing me on. I just wanted the audience to know that, you know, a, a little bit more insight to this religion, a little bit more insight to my family. They're a great family. It went, it went sour. That's the, that's the dilemma. It was a great family that went sour. It was never a sour family that became more sour. Okay? This is what happened. And, and that's the sad part of that story. OK, is that a family could be that good is now just gone the 180 degrees. That doesn't happen too often. That's like a shock to the system. And it's a huge shock to the system. Deservedly and so that's fine. But it is a bit it's a bit of a like, wow, reality check. Now, Joe, how would you expect current Scientologists in good standing? Because the, the Masterson family, other than Danny, is still in good standing, considered to have done nothing wrong. Yeah. How would would you? 
would you expect the Masterson family themselves to be a little bit of ostracized in polite Scientology society? I think they're going to be looked on a little bit differently, n n not as much interaction. Because, you know, Scientologists get really judgmental. One minute they're your friend, and as soon as there's a little speck of dirt on your universe, then you must be some out of its particle. So, therefore, we don't want to be connected to you. So, you, you know, that it just gets in that whole, you know, mental masturbation with the subject, okay? So, they're going to be feeling like, okay, where do we go now? And look, if they, if they get declared, and I wish they did, okay, for selfish reasons for about a minute of a second, I could call them, you know? Right. Be great. But if not, they got to live with that. Yeah. All right, man. Thank you again for joining right. me today. It's been a Good pleasure. Evening, Thank you for your time. I appreciate all your work for all the people that you communicate to. And it's much respect. Much respect. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to Thanks, you later. Guys. Cheers. Okay. If you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here if you have subscribed or not subscribe right here Bye.